The organization's head is Tedros Ghebreyesus. We cannot say this loudly enough, or clearly enough, or often enough. All countries can still change the course of this pandemic. Jane Halton has worked on pandemic planning. She's a former chair of the executive board of the WHO and a former health secretary in Australia. In December, Halton was part of a study with Johns Hopkins University that gamed out responses to a global virus threat. It would seem eerily prescient at one level, but in truth, of course, we do understand in the broad terms how these events pan out. We understand that if you don't manage to control spread early, the impact is greater. So what does containing the disease actually mean? Well, containment of the disease means you actually control and limit its spread. In other words, it doesn't spread to all corners of the globe. And it is still the case, if you look geographically, what you try to do is eliminate that virus in that community. You don't let it run its natural course, which would be, of course, a much higher attack rate. Many more people would get it than if you managed to contain it. I mean, I think all people who work in public health would hope that we could contain and therefore minimise the impact of this disease. But it's a big task, and I don't think any of us should underestimate how difficult that task is. In these gamed out scenarios, though, how does coronavirus end, or the imaginary virus that you were using? Well, in the gamed out scenarios, I mean, essentially, you end up with um, many hundreds of thousands of people who have died. And in that scenario, the, the numbers that you care about are, one, how many people get the disease, two, how many of them are seriously ill, and then also what is the death rate. So obviously a death rate of, say, 1% on a disease which doesn't impact very many people is not going to result in many deaths and also is not going to result in your health system being overwhelmed by all the people who need intensive care or ventilation at the one time. If, however, you have a huge number of people, say 30% of the population would get this virus, then you end up with many more people needing hospital care and most countries don't have idle hospital care available, idle intensive care available, and so therefore you end up with many more deaths. And in that scenario, as is the case with all diseases eventually, the scenario that we gamed in New York, uh, eventually that came to an end and ultimately of course you end up with pharmaceutical interventions, by that I mean treatments and a vaccine, and so you can then bring it under control. But it, it is undoubtedly the case that you end up with many, many, many deaths, and depending on the level of spread with this disease, um, that is the risk that we're all confronting. And what comes after containment itself? You try to minimise the impact. You are actually trying to buy the time to actually develop the vaccine at 12 to 18 months. Um, and the thing we need to remember, even when we get that vaccine developed, we have to produce it. And we have to actually think about where the priority is for the vaccine. So post-containment is we hope a world where we do have pharmaceutical interventions and other treatments available. Because these diseases will continue to circulate, we will know that. Once the gene is out of the bottle, you can't get it back in, but we need to be in a position where we can manage it much more effectively. Are, are, I mean, are you implying that COVID-19 is here forever? It's here to stay? It will be surprising if we ever completely eliminate this virus. Finally, Jane Halton, if you don't mind me asking, how have you prepared for yourself, for your family? Are you doing any flying? Uh, no, I will concede that I am not flying and I'm pretty much grounded in Australia until the bulk of this passes. I mean, there's two reasons for that and not necessarily that I have a particular personal concern about my own safety, but I'm also worried about the notion of one being stuck somewhere but also the impact that I might have if I pass the disease on to somebody who is very vulnerable. And we know particularly for older people and people with comorbidities, other diseases and illnesses mm. that make them vulnerable if they become ill. And I think everyone's got a responsibility not just to think about themselves, but also other people in the community and their loved ones. Jane Halton, former chair of the World Health Organization's executive board. Thank you very much. It was a complete pleasure. Thank you. As Jane pointed out, containment is key. And across the globe, people are trying hard to follow the best medical advice. So here's a random question. When did you last rub your eyes or put your hand to your chin? 
Well, whenever it was, stop it now. Health officials have been saying for weeks, do not touch your face. But as our own Rupa Shinoi reports, that is easier said than done. The person you're most likely to get coronavirus from is yourself. More specifically, your hands. Think of them as sponges soaking up the world and putting it in your eyes and mouth when you touch your face because you probably touch it all the time. Turns out there's a likely reason why. Social anxiety. Psychologist Kevin Chapman, director of the Kentucky Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders, says face touching is often a way to comfort ourselves, but it's not actually good for us. Although I'll feel better, it ultimately reinforces strong emotional states. So yes, it can be self-soothing, but it also can backfire and make strong emotions worse long term. Like any good, bad habit, it's hard to stop. And Chapman says all the talk about not touching faces will just make us all want to touch our face. Having a more flexible thought related to face touching, such as waking up and saying something along the lines of, I will be more aware of touching my face today is a much more flexible, way less punitive way to extinguish that behavior. Some people have been able to do it. And I haven't touched my face in weeks. <laughs> in weeks. Mr. President, I miss it. You... Others struggle. Even Singapore's Minister of Health, Gan Kim Yong. Even at a meeting that we have on this ministry task force, while I was speaking, I was touching my face. <laughs> Until Minister Lawrence Wong nudged me with his elbow and said, stop touching your face. It's possible people in some cultures might have an easier time stopping than others. Vladimir Alonso is a global health researcher with the University of Sao Paulo who contrasted face-touching habits in Brazil and the U.S. And he says he hasn't observed a big difference. Everyone seems to do it almost constantly. But he says some cultures are more touch-oriented in general than others, maybe making the face-touching in those places more dangerous. Mediterranean people, they, you know, like to greet each other very warmly. So I think that until we have a crisis uh, going on, people keep doing that, you know, saying hello and kissing and uh, hugging and all of that. Italy's special commissioner for coronavirus has suggested Italians need to tone down their warm culture. France's minister went further, advising people to stop greeting each other with kisses. When German Chancellor Angela Merkel swept into a meeting and offered her hand for a shake to the German interior minister, he waved her away. <laughs> Normally, that would be rude. These days, it gets a laugh. Online videos demonstrate other alternatives to handshaking, like touching feet or bumping elbows. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said people should take a cue from India and greet each other by putting their palms together and saying namaste. Vladimir Alonso of the University of Sao Paulo says that's good advice, but people should remember they're still touching lots of surfaces that other people have touched after they touched their faces. So he says the best we can hope for, for now, is just to get people thinking about what they do with their hands. If we can change, it will be fine. It's, it's going to help. It might mean we'll be a little more prepared when the next big pandemic sweeps the globe. Rupa Shinoi reporting there. When I speak with people around the world about COVID-19, I get a range of reactions from fear and panic to a blasé, it's nothing kind of attitude. So what's the correct response? I put that question to Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. He was a health policy advisor in the Obama White House. It depends whether you're a public health expert worrying about the overall public health or you're an individual trying to figure out the individual situation. So if you think about it from an individual standpoint, the risks are low. We, we know that the numbers we're seeing everywhere in the world are probably significant underestimates because there's a lot of either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic people who we haven't tested. But nonetheless, from any individual standpoint, you know, it's kind of like having the flu around. You don't really change your life that much because of the flu. On the other hand, if you're a public health expert, there are lots of things to worry about. What, what is the correct response if you're a public health official? What's the difference? Well, public health officials are looking at the whole population. And, uh, you know, if you look at flu in the United States, that's like 55,000 deaths. 
and we know that this coronavirus infection probably has a slightly higher death rate, although we can't be sure. Of, but if this virus spreads to millions of people, that adds up. We may need more respirators. We may need more infrastructure than we have at the moment. So from a public health standpoint, this is a serious emergency. From an individual standpoint, it should change your behavior in a good way. You should wash your hands more, keep your hands out of your face more. But whether it should change your behavior, assuming you're relatively healthy, etc., that I think is a separate question. Why is public trust in their public officials uh, so important at a moment like this? Well, they're going to have to guide you as to what the right behaviors are. And you have to trust them that they're giving you valid information. You know, if they're closing down a school, you have to trust them that that's okay. If they reopen the school and say it's safe, you have to trust them that that's okay to send your kids to school. So I think having the public follow what they're being told to do is, I think, very, very important. And not to panic. I mean, we have already seen some of the economic consequences, people boycotting Chinese restaurants as if, you know, this virus is, you know, hanging out in Chinese restaurants, which is totally false yet can have devastating consequences for people without any factual basis. So I think understanding what's actually happening and being able to rely on your public officials is important. Yeah, don't panic. Uh, that's a tough one to kind of have realized. How do you build public trust? Like what experiences did you have in the Obama administration with this sort of thing? You have to acknowledge it's going to get worse before it's going to get better. Because of more testing, we're going to see a big increase in the number of cases. We may see a big increase in the number of deaths, unfortunately. So you just have to acknowledge to people, here are the data, here's why it's happening. Second, you have to give people, we're on top of this. Here are the five things we're doing. You know, we are going to make sure there's no drug shortages, so we're working with the drug companies to get the raw materials. We are going to make sure there's no shortage of personal protective equipment. We're going to make sure that, you know, we have hospital surge capacity in the areas that we have. We're going to let you know what we're doing and give you reliable information. And we're not going to sugarcoat things because in the long run, which may be just a week, people are going to find out, oh, there's a lot more cases of coronavirus and they weren't telling the truth. And it's hard to get, regain trust once you've created that disinformation for people. Um, how important is data from China on this disease and the results they had in their containment and treatment efforts? How much do you trust that data? It's hard to know how much to trust it. I think some of this is pride, some of this is uncertainty and not wanting, you know, necessarily bad information out there. The contrast is, say, with Singapore, which has been fantastically transparent, all the data is available, and you have a lot of faith that um, you know exactly what's happening in that uh, city state. And uh, that's the sort of model we all ought to adopt. But we do use the data, you know, what people regularly say, well, 80% of people, it's a very mild case or they're even asymptomatic. Well, that's based on data from China. We don't know, you know, how reliable that is. And second of all, that might be slightly different in the United States. They have a very high smoking rate, for example, mm. in China, especially among men. And that may be skewing. They may have more serious cases than we're likely to see or we might see in the United States. Um, on the other hand, we have more obese people, and that may skew it so that we have more serious and complicated cases. It, you know, it's just hard to know how to extrapolate that data. Former health policy advisor in the Obama White House, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, now vice provost of global initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Good to speak with you. Take care. And you're listening to Boston Calling on the BBC World Service with me, Marco Werman. Coming up, a group of Mexican nurses has a message for you. Wash your hands. The hand-washing how-to video that's all over the Internet. In the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, nearly 300 million children are skipping school with permission. Classes have been canceled in more than 20 countries, leaving some kids at loose ends as Sarah Birnbaum has been finding out. In India's capital, New Delhi, primary schools are now shut down until the end of the month. Teresa asked her eight-year-old son, Shreyas, what he thought about that. I feel pretty good. I can play with my friends right now. You think uh, you will be only playing or is there anything else you'll be doing in your time? Yes, watching TV. It's kind of adorable how he's totally missing his mom's point that maybe he could keep up with his schoolwork too. You think you'll miss school? No, never. 
six-year-old Giorgio in Rome is on the same page. I love staying at home with my mommy. I asked Giorgio how he was keeping himself busy in addition to playing with mommy. He said he was doing homework and walking his dog. And his four-year-old sister, Emma, wanted to add this footnote. Uh, in English, mi piace. I love my doggy. I love my doggy and I love stay at home with my brother. Oh. It's been a bit more trying for kids in China, which was the first country to suspend classes. Four-year-old Leo in Shanghai has been off since January 17th, and he really misses school. To ease the pain of separation a little, Leo's school lets kids call in two to three times a week to leave messages for each other and their teachers. This preschooler is saying, I really want to go back to school soon. All the messages sound like that. It kind of breaks your heart. In Tokyo, schools have been closed for about a week, and the local parks are filled with kids. But middle schooler Mika isn't going out much. She's focused on self-betterment. It's like small goals they've like pushed away over time that now you have time to do. So I've been trying to learn to play a certain song on the piano. I feel like going out with my friends is a, is a waste of like this whole closing school. Why? Because the goal was to reduce large get-togethers and like it doesn't need to be a large get-together. It doesn't need to be a large get-together, says the exasperated older sister in high school, Leah. Somewhat ironic coming from you, says the younger sister. Okay, well, what you do is a large get-together, so... And remember, this is not a quarantine. Also, Leah isn't ignoring her schoolwork entirely. In fact, she has some advice for other kids who have to stay home from school. Staying home is going to be a real test of your self-control, so don't slack off. Hear that, kids? This is not a vacation. Don't slack off and don't touch your face. Wow, a lot of work to do. Sarah Birnbaum reporting there. In China right now, the country where the new coronavirus originated, some areas are finally starting to lift lockdowns. Last month, a Chinese family that lives in California was visiting the city of Lanzhou in China. Unexpectedly, Elizabeth's son, her husband, and their kids all found themselves stuck in a lockdown that lasted weeks. It's really scary. I don't want to bring my kids outside. So she established a quarantine lesson plan. Uh, math, English, I really keep them dizzy. The idea is do something. That was Elizabeth's son speaking a couple of weeks ago. This past week, our own Monica Campbell checked in with them to see how the family is doing now that the lockdown is slowly being lifted. The other day, after nearly six weeks inside a tiny apartment, the kids finally went outside. Everybody was so excited. I was very excited to bring them outside. It was a chance to feel the sun and run. But after a few steps, Francine, who's 10, felt ill. I felt like I was going to throw up. I haven't been outside in a long time. It was sensory overload. The smells, definitely. Like the smells of car exhaust? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. She doesn't feel well. Yes, she said, oh, I want to go go back to the apartment. Elizabeth also worried when her boy Liam, he's six years old, got winded after just running a block. He'd been cooped up so long. It was very slow. The family sent me a video, and listen, you'll hear little Liam sprinting down the street like his old self. Running around, you can see... Normally, the family lives near San Francisco, but in January, they traveled to China to renew their U.S. work visas and see family, and they got stuck. The U.S. Embassy in Beijing still has their passports, which the parents turned over to start the visa process. It's unclear when those visas will be issued. It's really hard. We're just waiting and waiting. They were very relieved when the lockdown ended, but there's still a big challenge, face masks. They're required to wear them outside, and they're hard to find. Elizabeth says she rushed over when she spotted a woman selling masks on the street. She bought 50. That supply is dwindling. How many masks do you have right now on hand? I still have 20. 20 for, for the whole family? 
Yeah, for the whole family. Every time we go out, we need a fall. They only have 20 disposable masks left. Every family outing means using up four of the masks, and they must reserve enough to go out food shopping. So even though they can go outside, they really can't that often. We don't have enough masks. We still stay in the home, stay in the apartment. Unable to go outside much, they've started exercising indoors, running in place, doing calisthenics. I asked Francine, the daughter, her advice for parents if their kids are stuck inside for a long time. Get them plenty of arts and craft materials <laughs> and let them play plenty of video games and they won't bother you. Francine has also been writing poetry about the virus. No more salutations, no more greetings, and most definitely no more meetings. The vendors and restaurants have shut down. It has become a very lonely town. A reflection on life being far from normal. A reminder of what many of us could yet experience. Monica Campbell there. In Mexico, three nurses have unintentionally become heroes in the fight against the coronavirus, thanks to a video that went viral, excuse the pun, teaching the rest of us how to wash our hands like real pros. Jorge Valencia has been checking it out. The three nurses, they're wearing blue scrubs, standing in front of a painting with a serene waterfall, and they're dancing in place. And now we are going to teach you, they sing. Yo soy la de la orilla derecha. <laughs> Xochitl Ruiz Morales tells me that in the video, she is the one on the right. And Rosalia Morales Toledo jokes that she is the one shaking her hips the most. La que mueve más las caderas, dice <laughs> <laughs> and Yesenia Benitez Colón is in the center. Soy enfermera de, del Hospital de Alta Especialidad del Estado de Oaxaca. The three of them are nurses at a hospital in Mexico's southern state of Oaxaca. And the video, they made it in Xochitl's house on one of their days off. Bueno, lo hicimos este, por el, en conmemoración del Día Internacional del Lavado de Manos. Xochitl says they did it for Global Handwashing Day. Yes, that is actually a thing. Sí, sí existe. It's on October 15th. It's sponsored by Colgate Palmolive, the London School of Hygiene, and a few others. Management at the hospital in Oaxaca decided to have a contest ahead of the holiday. <laughs> bueno, la idea surgió, yo creo que fue simultánea, ¿no? Yesenia says she and her two friends together came up with the idea to make the video. El beneficio de, de, de enfermería es que hay mucho trabajo en equipo. The good thing about nursing is that you have to work as a team, Yesenia says. The three of them have become good friends. They've been working together for eight years in the intensive care unit. El ritmo de la música realmente se me ocurrió a mí. Se me hizo una, una canción muy pegajosa. En ese tiempo... Rosalía says she had the idea to use the beat from a song that was already popular. They wrote lyrics.